Here we are back for another episode of 10P ATX Radio from 10th Planet Austin at On It Gym MMA. Today's guest is Douglas Frey from Team Ethos at the UFC gym in North Richland Hills, Texas. Um, he coached two of our MMA classes this week. We did 10 Round Tuesday together, got to talking, and I, he, I thought he'd be a great guest on the podcast. And I tried to ask the questions that would draw some of his um, you know, knowledge of the sport out. He has over, he has 30 um, MMA fights and Muay Thai fights combined. Um, he's been a coach for, I think, full, now full-time, about five years, but I'm, uh, he probably was coaching a bit before them and as well, um, considering the, the experience he has that dates all the way back to 2004 and then being a wrestler prior to that through high school. Um, his wife is Jen Hugh Frey, and she is Invicta FC's Adam Weight champion currently and an on it athlete. I wasn't able to ask as many questions as I would like. We had to finish up. We have a podcast studio we're going to put in here, but we had a class about to start, and um, it was it was great. And I, I look forward to talking to both of them next time they're in Austin uh, again. And you can follow Doug on social media at Douglas Frey uh, at Douglas dot Frey. Frey is F R E Y, and you can follow Jen at. J I N H Y U F R E Y. And you can follow me at Zach Moore NFL. That's Zach with a K, Moore with two O's. Um, and uh, before going further, our sponsors, uh, you can use the coupon code 10PATX at Onnit, which is where we are right now, and at hypnotic.com. Hypnotic is a jiu jitsu company. Um, the jiu jitsu planner, you can use the coupon code GOHARD, and all sales of the jiu jitsu planner will be sending 10% to Justin Wren's fight for the forgotten and um, we'll send 10% more through by using the coupon code GOHARD and you'll get 10% off. Um, you can search 10PATX on Amazon for all your 10PATX uh, gear, like t-shirts and sweatshirts. And you can buy my book at Caponomics, uh, at Amazon, uh, Caponomics Building Super Bowl Champions if you like NFL football. Um, and without further ado, uh, get into the podcast with Douglas Frey and uh, I hope you enjoy. 10th Planet Austin. All right. Here we are back, 10P ATX Radio with Douglas Frey, MMA coach from up in Dallas from Genesis Jiu Jitsu, right? Uh, no, we're at the, uh, we're Team Ethos. We train team the, Ethos. Yeah, Team Ethos MMA. Uh, we're Team Ethos <laughs> MMA. Uh, the, <laughs> I'm the that UFC too, bro. Gym I'm that <laughs> in North Richland Hills. All right, yep. cool, cool. And then, um, and I know you, you train quite a few professional fighters. Yes, yes. Yourself, and, and you were a professional fighter yourself as yeah, well? Yeah, hung up the gloves uh, five years ago this month, actually. I had 30 fights uh, with uh, MMA and Muay Thai as well, and I fought a lot, man. Fought a lot. And yeah. you and you started as a wrestler as well? Started as a wrestler 22 years ago in Amarillo, Texas. Yeah. And when you were freshman year high school is what, what I saw? Yep. And then why, why did you get into martial arts? What was what was it that like drove you to pursue this passion of yours now? Um, I, had, I had gone from... Uh, Emerald College got accepted to the UT Arlington, uh, transferred down there in August of 2005, and my younger brother uh, moved into the moved into my house, and um, it was Christmas of that that of 2005, and he just saw that there was kind of a void that needed to be filled. He knew that I still wanted to fight. I, I growing up in Amarillo is kind of the mecca for mixed martial arts um, in the mid 90s and late 90s. In um, Texas? In Texas um, and, and in the South because Evan Tanner, Paul Buntello, Keith Heron, these are guys that have made it into the upper echelons over the years or had um, who I grew up watching fight. I went to the same high school as, as Heath Herring. His younger brother was uh, on the wrestling team with me and so I, I grew up watching these guys and wanting to do it knowing knowing that one day I, I could be a professional fighter. I wanted to be a professional fighter and um, Fast forward years later, um, uh, going to UTA and my brother for a, a Christmas gift got me a, a three month membership to a place that promoted MMA. And I went in, I signed up and I didn't look back. I started training two a days right yeah. there. Within yeah. seven months I had my first fight and, uh, and just the wheels kept going in motion. It was the snowball effect, if you will. I think the people that know that they're gonna be like into <clears throat> it, like they're into it from like the, the first day. For me, 
when I first started training at, I first started training in New Jersey, from New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, my first school was a Henzo affiliate, um, which is Silver Fox Jiu Jitsu in Saddlebrook, New Jersey. Awesome school. Um, and just, I, I, the first day they kind of show you what's going on. They kind of show you like how a rear naked choke works and stuff. And I'm like, and I had known for a few like years that I, was, I had a neck issue and I knew I was going to get back get in back into something. I needed something. And I knew how jiu-jitsu was the thing because all the podcasts we listened to, everyone I was talking about how great jiu-jitsu is and all this kind of stuff for self-improvement. And it was like day one, I was like, I'm hooked. I'm yep. in here. I'm going to be in here all the time. Like, this is my new thing. And um, yeah, I mean, to just, what did your what did your brother see that you, because I had the same feeling. And, it, and I believe I saw that 1998 was your freshman year of high school. Oh no, the, no see, 98, 99, 2000, 2000, it was 97, 97 was the, was the first year of high school. So you were right around 20, 21 years old and you were just probably mm -hmm. similar to where I was, which was just trying to figure out. Yeah, I, I, I had, I had violent tendencies. I, I loved to fight, but I was kind of, yeah. always a kind of a smaller guy and, um, and in order for me to not have street fights, I kind of needed another outlet where I could, I could exhaust myself physically and still be able to get that. Get, use those violent tendencies that I have ultimately. And um, and yeah, you know, so like growing up, uh, I was the guy like every weekend, everybody's like, where's, where's Doug Fry fighting? Where's where's Doug fighting? What backyard? What, like who's he fighting? And it was just, it, I had a lot of fights. I was in a lot of street fights growing up, um, just a kind of a rowdy kid. And um, the day that I started training MMA, like since then I had, I never had another street fight. I had a couple yeah. of close calls, but I was always able to defuse them. So what it is, it really made me uh, get a form of self-identity um, yeah. and be confident within myself to know that I don't have to prove anything anymore. Like I, I have a skill set that I know within myself and if I want to, if I needed to, um, I could defend myself in a, in a very brutal form, uh, you know, yeah. in a very skilled form. Um, the it's confidence of that is just like so it's astounding it yeah really because is. you're just like in every situation you're like i don't need to deal with that i could i could i could deal with that myself if i really needed to anyway exactly you know yeah. and it's just like there's no like more machismo and what you're saying too about um identity and violent tendencies and uh, i played football my whole life and i always knew that there was something about football that was going to keep me from doing the wrong things mm -hmm. And I knew that if I didn't have, so I, I was always like, I need to play college football. I need to figure out how to do that because this was prior to figuring out, like now, if I was 18 a day, there's always, there's jujitsu and there's all this other stuff there, right? right? Like, but then it was 2008 when I went to college and, um, you know, and, and then through high school and all that. And MMA wasn't really on my radar for whatever reason. I, I never really got into the UFC or heard of the UFC until like the last five, like, oh, I heard about it prior, but never really got too into it. But um. But the identity aspect and the having something that makes you feel good about yourself as a kid too it helps you avoid. It gives you something to lose too. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, I mean, you start you start especially acquiring friendships, you the relationships, friendships uh, within that that community of people that are doing the exact same thing to you. If you fuck that up and then that's taken away, you're you're taking your own passion away. You're you're being your own own worst enemy if you fuck up in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing about being being an OG now, I mean, because mm -hmm. being being a guy who was in the MMA in two thousand four, um, I mean, it's kind of an OG in, in somewhat in some ways in the sport. I mean, because the sport really first came about in ninety three, and now ten years later, and this sport still isn't isn't at an evolved place yet. Like you said, that you were you were sparring hard going on, <laughs> like coming up. Yeah. So, um, like a couple of my main training partners, they're still they're still carving the path. Uh, one of them, he's still in the UFC. His name's Chas Skelly. Uh, the other one is Johnny Bedford, and he's the uh, he's the the bantamweight bare knuckle uh, fighting championship world champion. Um, and uh, Will Camposano, who's got his own school now in Frisco. And uh, th there's there's a few of us that our training about ten years ago, nine years ago, ten years ago, was us just putting on four ounce MMA gloves, mouthpieces, four and ounces, yeah. going to fuck each other up. And, and in shin, shin pads as well. And it was it was just a full on fight. And we were like, you know, we get done, we're like, yeah, that was training and we're leaking. We got blue up, black eyes and, you know, we're all fucking hurt because we've been just fighting each other for, for a full hour. And, uh, <laughs> and you know what, in those, in those days, like when we'd go fight in Louisiana, we'd go fight in, in Oklahoma, we'd fight on the regional circuit in Texas. Yeah, that helped. It made us tough as now. It's like we were fight ready, fight prepared. But it wasn't skill prepared. It wasn't skill training. It wasn't learning how to do things 
Um, uh, we ultimately we were coaching ourselves. Yeah. In, in, a, in, a, in a small yeah. group, and then we ended up having good coaches as well. It's starting with good coaches, having us as our own coaches, and then having good coaches on the back end as well. Yeah, and and with what you're saying though too is that it made me realize when you're talking about hard sparring, and then now where you are now as a coach, yeah, is that when you were hard sparring, you were at a point where because MMA was so young, there weren't really systems, and because we talk about any system, right? right? And there weren't really systems in place at that time for um, MMA fighters to kind of learn through and go through and really actually train as a student. It felt like, and it, at least that's that's my perception of it was that. You guys going through that sparring were the people who then now are in a position where you've gone through the war to figure out what the what the systems are and how, how to actually do the coaching and how to do it piece by piece like you do out there with us in the MMA class the last the last two classes we've had. Yeah, certainly. Like um, nowadays, I mean, you you come train with me for a month. There's not going to be hardly any hard sparring. There's a lot of technical work. Um, and, and, and when I mean hard sparring, I mean with the punches and the kicks, specifically yeah. the kickboxing aspect. Because in the grappling aspect, we're going hard. Yeah. It's, it's hard grappling, which in a sense can be a, can still be as dangerous, but you're not taking damage to the head, damage yeah. to the brain. You can't condition the brain. No, uh, no matter how many shots, you, you only get so many shots to the brain before it's like... There's a bad ROI on it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely there is. Um, there Now, there is a time and a place for hard sparring. In, in the ne initial phases of... Of teaching these young kids about like you got to learn to be able to be punched in the belly really hard you know in the liver and the uh, in the solar plexus and have that life sucked out of you and not fold you know and yeah. um, and that can be considered hard sparring now does it benefit them to take a big hook upside the temple be dizzy as fuck almost half knocked out and make and push them forward and make them go uh, continue in with a with a, a sparring round I don't think so anymore I don't yeah. I don't think that that helps anybody um, other than to show that you're tough, that you survived it. Congratulations. But we're all in here because we are tough. We, we've seen Cowboy in here. And Cowboy is just kind of doing, just, just, do, like, he's not going hard. And he, that's Cowboy's throne. Yep. You know, I mean, he's not going, you know, crazy and, anymore. And I can guarantee you in his heyday, whenever he was doing the, the tap out show, motherfucker was doing, going hard, doing oh, hard sparring. Yep. Time. And he's, he's, he's learned, he's grown out of it, he's evolved out of it. And, then, like, do you see... Uh, I mean, there's a lot of guys coming up now, and I think you have a, a few really quite young fighters, like 22, 23 year old type of guys that are now pro coming up and probably in this position now where you're seeing people that are coming up as mixed martial artists rather than what you had to do uh, in some sense is take wrestling, take Muay Thai, and put them together, right? Absolutely. The, the, it's, the, it's the new breed uh, where these kids have been training much longer, um, but they began training in all facets at one time, and they're, they've become a little bit more of true mixed martial artist in the initial phase versus going, okay, he's a wrestler who is now learning boxing. He's a jiu-jitsu guy who's just now learning Muay Thai, um, which we still have pockets of that of that happening, but for the most part, because this is an evolving sport and the coaches coaches themselves, like myself, I'm, I'm a young coach, I'm able to evolve them as well to make them more well-rounded right from the get-go, to make sure that they are competent in all facets of mixed martial arts right off the bat instead of having such a strong point one place and, and being much weaker in another. And then the thing too is that when we talk about systems is that with eddies, there's the ways that, the way to move through it. And then in MMA now, there's the paths that you can carve out that are, that are you're going from striking, you're going to wrestling, you're going to jiu -jitsu. Here's the way through this kind of path towards a submission, a knockout or damage of some kind, which is interesting to me to see that now that I'm doing, we've just been doing a few MMA classes here now, but then to see that those steps that you're probably now, you create on your own with, with your with your system. Like, whoa, how did you, how did you, when you were first starting out, how did you figure out how to piece it all together? Oh, it was trial and error. Um, yeah. it, it was, um, it wasn't, and there was no, there was no clear path to what I call the blends. Being yeah. seamless with, with going from striking into grappling, uh, or wrestling, going from wrestling into submission game, getting from off your back back into the to the standing position, the neutral position, and going back into striking, and make it seem like it's like it's blended where it's seamless, like it's like it's one discipline. Um, there wasn't that. Um, that was me uh, being aware that 
that I could bring something new to the sport, um, and, and not necessarily new because there there are great coaches that have have been Your own new. for me. My own new, yeah, my yeah, own, my yeah. own system of my own experiences um, um, within it, and then developing these paths to get into certain positions for finishes to win fights um, and win them wherever the fight may go and where we can dictate. Um, whether it be again uh, in the striking department on the on the ground with using our fist and our shins and our knees and all the the knockout points or the submission points mm -hmm. but uh on that point is that mm -hmm. you've you've talked quite a bit about um <laughs> you've, you've brought up twice about your your issues with uh with judging and so for you and then for within your system as well what are like the main principles of emphasis like you got three or five things that are the most important things within a, the system of within the sport of martial arts within how to create how, victory. how to win a fight yeah, yes how to yeah. win. Um, because of the judging and competency that is still riddled and plagued throughout um, the entire world of mixed martial arts uh, there are specifically two um, that I can say and that is <clears throat> if you're on your back because of the incompetency of judges you in their eyes more often than not, if you're on your back, even with an acting guard, you are losing in the judge's eyes because the top person is having that top side control and they may not even be causing a lot of damage. Now, so with my, uh, with my team, I specifically, I stress um, that they must, if they shoot some submissions off your back, play off of your back, but don't get comfortable with staying on your back. If those submissions start getting shut down, we need to look for reversal. Yeah, we need to look, to, yeah, look to scramble to get back up to our feet um, into a neutral position. The other one is when we're in a top side position, let's say we've knocked somebody down, but they have a really dangerous, very active guard, but we're stood over the top of them. Stay there because now we're in a time management position to where we are stood over our opponent. We're kicking their legs. We're punching their belly. Maybe getting a couple of headshots in there. We're protecting ourselves from up kicks with really good posture, but we're in a time management position where that clock is ticking, and we're in an advantage position, a winning position. So, yeah, keep going, keep going. Keep yeah, going. so th those are like like two of my my main ones that I really stress with the team, um, because part of part of part of what you were what I just took out of what you just said is that um, there's 15 minutes. How are you going to manage those 15 minutes to be the person that? looks like they want it in case it goes to a decision and then when you have the opportunities to do the things that can finish the fight be ready and prepared to do those things that, that can't finish the fight more often than not all of the uh, the, the grappling system all of the our transitions they lead us into a, an offensive position in a position that from an outsider's eye you look like you're in a winning yeah, position yeah. and that in, in that sense when you can even if you are not being able to be super active offensively but you're controlling the position. I mean, because of the incompetency of judges, they're not all there. And it does. And positioning has a lot to do with winning a fight as well. But a lot of times we get fucking tired. People have botched weight cuts. Like just the conditioning aspect, you're not able to be as active. Let's say going from the mats in, in your, your gym or your school into competition, you feel the stress and maybe you're able to get into that position and kind of hold on, but you're not able to cause all the damage to create an opening for a submission or for a TKO or KO victory. But you're in the advantage position, and you're able to hold that advantage position. You're able to shut down their reversals and escapes and things like that. And again, so you're winning by position, by time management in those positions. And how do you feel like you know? I mean, you got you said you almost had thirty fights, or yeah, thirty. Yeah, thirty. Yeah, yeah, thirty fights. So, how much does that going through the that? I mean, for lack of a better word, going through your own wars put you in a position where you are able to be this general now of. I mean, I've, I've, it's been, I, I've been through the thick, um, is what it is. I've been, I've been through um, some wars, and so whenever I'm talking to these fighters, they, especially the new ones who, I mean, some that have never been in a, in a street fight, never punched a person a day in their life, they're like, I kind of like this mixed martial arts, maybe it's something gonna, it's gonna be for me. And then they start having these technical sparring rounds and they get cracked in the head, and it's like, you start to see them kind of want to cower away, and they look over at me, and I'm just like, "This is this is part this of the game. Yeah, you, you got to you got to you got to show your dead face. Be dead, deadpan. Don't show emotion when you get punched. Don't show that negativity when you're when you're winning. When you throw good, don't show the optimism. Be dead face. Like don't don't show any emotion within that. Be stoic about it. Be stoic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, and 
and what that, happened is an objective thing. It just it happened, and now you're on to the next yep, thing. I read that somewhere the other day. And it was yep, and it should resonate with the, with the fighters, um, and, and it does help. Um, but with me specifically going through all the wars that I that I ended up going through, and I say that in a loosely term because I was never in the in the in the service, but in these cage wars, if you will, yeah. um, one on one war. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we, don't, we don't have a whole arm, we don't have a whole army with us in there. That's but right. It's one on one. The uh, yeah, I'm able to. Um, I'm able to uh, give a bit of a, a a clear head to some of the fighters who maybe just get a little bit too frustrated or depressed or um, have self doubt, and it's like, listen, like, don't worry, like, this isn't the worst that could happen. You're supposed yeah. to go through this right now. That way, when you get into a, a high stress situation, a fight, if you will, um, and and something like this happens to you, it's water on a duck's back. You just yeah. keep that chin down and you continue going forward. You you get up here, you, you're able to straighten things out without showing anything externally. That's something interesting about um, about people who've gone through some shit, mm -hmm. um, which is prevalent in sports and football, sports of uh, com uh, MMA, which is, like there's certain, so I had a, a friend who's a mental coach and he would work with organizations in the NFL about trying to find how to find the right recruits, right? And one of the X factors he always found was the dudes who had been through some stuff and could realize that whatever they're going through right now isn't really a big deal. Right. They've been in a worse situation. And then one story that always stuck out to me was there was a player who, uh, who had like a shoulder injury and he played the whole season with like a busted up shoulder. And his re reasoning behind it was my mom has cancer right now. If she can do that, I can do this. And he was like a third round pick for like the Steelers and went on to be a tremendous player for him. And it's like the mental toughness that some of these guys have, um, you know, is what separates them. You know, I've got I've got a similar story with my nephew. Uh, his name's Arian Yu, and uh, and Arian uh, had his senior year of, of high school um, last year, or the year before. It's it, it's pretty recent, and um, and he was wrestling, and his goal was to make it to the state uh, state tournament. Yeah. And early within the season, um, he ended up getting a, a torn rotator cuff. Yeah. He didn't go get it checked out because he knew if he got when he got it checked out, the doctor said he was he would have been done sports, for the entire yeah. season. Yeah. yeah. And. Um, and kind of lost that dream. So he pushed forward and pushed forward and did so well and he made it to the state tournament. And I think he placed maybe sixth place um, in the tournament, which is still pretty pretty freaking good. Um, and then afterwards he went and had surgery and, and all that, but it was like, it it was a pretty bad injury that could have put anybody on the shelf for, for a while and, and taken them out of uh, out of wrestling specifically, because that, that, it's so hard on the, on the shoulders. But the mental, toughness mental fortitude he had to persevere on to have all those other duels and and tournaments and be able to perform at at 60 percent of his level you know 30 percent with his shoulder whatever and um and get through those and win a bunch of matches and 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 have that stamp of um what's a, what's a good way to put it like well, he, I, when he when he's when he's older when he's like 23 and he's in this position that we both have experienced mm -hmm. where it's like i don't know what's next for me kind of thing he's gonna be like man whatever's next i'm gonna be fine yeah because i've already done it and that's part of what pulls you through those moments too is they have been those past experiences those examples of yourself that you can call back on that now you're like you're going through this tough thing and you're like shit i've i've already gone through that so so what is it you know what what's gonna stop this, you? I, this is nothing like i've been i've been through the yeah. physical pain for months and months and months this is nothing this is a, you know this is a small roadblock i mean how okay. does how does having 30 fights i mean what is the what is the mental, right? Because something that Curtis said uh, about these podcasts too, so he likes getting into like, what are the principles of what, what are the principles that make that make up up here? Like your philosophies, all these sorts of things. And one thing for you is like, what is it like to have gone through, and for you too, what is it like to have gone through all these fights and like, and have persevered through whatever you've gone through in each individual fight? What is that mental, uh, affirmation self-talk like for you? I mean, it, it just proved to myself that I, that I belong being here. Uh, that in this, within this chosen path that um, I'm here for a reason. And, you know, with those 30 fights, um, I didn't, I never took any injuries. I never, I had to go to the hospital one time. It was my very last fight because I fought in a third world country and I got split under the eye. And um, they were like, we need to take you to the hospital to get you stitched up. And I've always been stitched up cage side. And, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and I was like, yeah, okay, that's fine. They had a plastic surgeon resident on there. I had the most beautiful stitch, again, in a third world country of Trinidad and Tobago. 
And, oh, uh, and so my I had to break the streak though of not ever having to go to the hospital or having to, I still haven't had a major injury, you know, and, and I'm thankful for that, that I've had a healthy body for it. Uh, Cause this shit is hard, it's hard on the body. Um, but, but going in the cages is one of the scariest things that a human can do. And, and, and but you learned like learn leading up to it, leading up to it, there's a lot of there's a lot of self doubt. There's a lot of did I did I train enough? Well, fuck, I, I skipped that practice. Is that because I skipped that practice? Am I now fucked in, in this fight? What? Yeah, like what? What if I lose because of that? I, there's a lot of internal self doubt. Um, but at the same time, when when it's time to go, your hands get wrapped, your music starts playing, and you start making that walk. For the most part, for me, all that sheds sheds right away, and it's a hyper focus. And then you get in the cage, and it's like, here we go, yeah. motherfucker! Like this is yeah. this is what I signed up for, and yeah. um, and it becomes, you know, who's going to be the better man that night? And you know, often it was me, and often it was not me. I had <laughs> I fought a lot of really tough guys, yeah. and uh, and I had my hand raised a lot, and I had my hand not raised a lot uh, to better men that night. The, the uh, what was that moment like when you when your music would go off? Um, what does that feel like? Because when I was a kid, I would have the butterflies, but then the kickoff would be in the air, and I'd be back ready to, re to return the kickoff, and it would go away. Because I was about to get hit, and it was over. There was no more thinking about it. And I guess that might be, this is the kickoffs in the air. My music's on, kind of. Well, so there's there's the whole thinking, um, the mental aspect of leading up to it. Like, how deep did, did you go into your mind? How, how much did you think about this one moment? And... Which, what I found out is getting stuck in a loop, like, okay, here in the music walk, I need to walk this way, I need to strut this way, I need to feel this way. Well, the, make, making yourself do something like that, like in making yourself, it kind of gets you out of your element. So what I, what I found is being a little bit more free flowing. Um, if I didn't feel like cracking pads near as hard for, for this fight, I didn't. There was no yeah. reason to do that because I wasn't gonna force myself to be in a, in a, in a mental state when I was already in, in one. Now, if I was feeling, maybe if I had self doubt, and I was like, all right, if I if I crack pads really hard, it'll it'll kind of bring me back to that state of mind where it's time to fucking fight. It might like my Muay Thai fights, and because um, I had I had times where I was like, I just kind of feel dead, like my body just feels uh, asleep. I don't feel awake, but as soon as I start cracking pads, the vibrations and the the sound, and it's like okay. Body's awake, mind is awake. The, the the hyper focus begins to intensify. Then the music kicks on, and, it, and it's again, it's like, all right, here we go, let's fucking go. Is there anything that you've read that has helped you? Not necessarily, no. I saw, I whenever I was in um, uh, the later part of my MMA career, I saw a, a sports psychologist, and he gave me some some really good um, advice on basically control the controllables. Uh, mm -hmm. What I took Stoicism. from him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, and and just that. That helped me tremendously, and lying awake at night thinking about what was coming, the fight, the what ifs um, of, of what can happen during a fight, um, it made me be able to shut that off and go be present of mind. What am I doing right now? I'm trying to sleep. Okay, well, I'm gonna think about something that'll help me go to sleep, not not trying to stress myself out, and I'm, and I'm tense as fuck in bed, maybe starting to sweat, and I'm like, there's, there's no reason for that. Or, or driving and uh, in traffic and all of a sudden mind is starting to wander about the fight and I'm starting to get nervous and it's like, wait, wait, be present of mind. What am I doing right now? I'm driving. I need to focus on driving, focus on being present. Um, and that helped me fucking tremendously. But as far as like reading material in general, I didn't ever write, read any self-help books or anything like that that would, um, that could, that, that helped me at least in my path. Yeah. What, what would you, like, if you have a fight, like, now as a coach, like, you have multiple roles. Mm -hmm. You have, I'm teaching you about what you're doing on the mat, but then I'm also preparing you for this moment, for the, you going to the cage. If you, do you have any specific examples of a fighter that you've, that you've helped? You know, what, what is, like, probably the biggest issue that you face with a fighter that you've helped them overcome? Whether it's mental or, like, uh, maybe on the mental side or... You know what? For the most part, uh, like the biggest hurdles, weight, weight cuts. Weight cutting. Yeah, weight cutting. Yeah. Um, and and the 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 time leading up to the weight cut. Um, and you know, I've, I've trained a lot of uh, a lot of people that have, are. So fighters are emotional, in general. 
female fighters, because of the extra hormones, tend to be a little bit more emotional. And then we talk, start talking about like when they're when the cycle is involved and things like that. Yeah. And they become even even more emotional. So I can't. I can't imagine. Those those have been imagine. those have been challenges. So you know, obviously, my, my wife is a, is a world champion. So dealing with her has been has helped me and prepared me for the multiple females that I I I've coached from the amateur level into the UFC level, and um, and identifying those hormones and being able to to speak to them, knowing that they're going through a much more stressful internal situation than I can ever experience as a man. Yeah. Um, being able to work through that with with female fighters and athletes in general, I think has been um, a hurdle that had to be overcome and that had to be learned, and a lot of it had to be learned with working with my wife. <laughs> and what, what's it like to be in your wife's corner? Um, th that's the most stressful thing. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. so I'm a. I don't get when my fighters fight. There's a little bit of nerves, but I'm there to do a job. I'm there to be a coach. I, I prepared them. Now it's time for them to execute. You care about them, but they're not your wife. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, in my fights, there wasn't really nerves when it came time to perform. When my wife's fighting, I'm internally, I'm fucking screaming. <laughs> I'm a nervous wreck, man. And um, uh, over the years, like I, it used to be, like when she turned pro, and even in her last few amateur fights, before she fought, I'm running over to the. Um, to buy a couple of beers. No, I'm, I'm chugging down a couple of beers, man, to try to try to calm my nerves. And then maybe like her third or fourth professional fight, I can remember going, "All right, uh, I'm not going to have any beers." And I was nervous, but I got done, and I was like, "Okay, I can, you know, I can do this." And then now it's like I, the nerves are still there, but I'm able to keep them at bay, keep the keep the dead face, if you will. Same thing that we talk about in in the, in the competition phase, um, to not show anything externally because. If she sees me a wreck, obviously that's going to take her out of her own uh, mental state of the hyper focus of the fight. What, what, do you, what do you feel like? What is your job when you're in the corner? I mean, that's that's a different part of your job, right? I mean, it's a, um, I mean, it, it's you have the strategy. I mean, you strategize prior to the fight. 100%, yeah. Yeah, you have you have the strategy that you want to implement with your fighter, and then in the corner. I mean, how much how much can you really coach them up in terms of during the moment? During the uh, time when they're sitting on the stool between rounds, um, what do you feel like your role is there? Identify tendencies of yeah. the uh, of of what the the opponent is doing. Is doing on that particular night. You also watch film prior. And, yeah, and, exactly. So so it's... watching watching a lot of film, and whenever I'm watching film, I'm trying to watch as much as their amateur shit all the way up, leading into where they are to this day, to identify what tendencies have continued to stick, continue to stick, continue to stick, ah. and continue to stay there. So whenever I see them fight. And we start to see that shoulder move that's going into a, a type of maybe an overlapping combination. It's like, okay, the, here this comes, and here it comes, and we're ready for it. So we're able to defend to it and then counter off of it or create that opening and execute off of that opening. Um, and so being able to identify tendencies in those, those split moments and then on the in-between rounds, um, sitting them down, the most, the most important thing is just breathe. Just yeah. breathe, bring your heart rate down, yeah. drink some water, okay, this is what I saw, this is what we need to do right here, and keep it very simple, two yeah. or three instructions, yeah. breathe, breathe, okay, go give me another round just like that, go get it. And part of your job is being calm. 100%. No matter what's going on. Can't right? be too high, can't be screaming in their fucking face, because yeah. not everybody responds well to that. Uh, my wife, in particular, like, I can't, I can't be yelling at Jen uh, in between rounds. I, I can't be in the corner during the round and screaming at Jen a combination or anything like that. I've got to be a little bit more low key, much more calm. Um, still using kind of a battlefield voice yeah. so that she can hear me over the crowds, unless she's fighting in Japan where you can, I don't have to talk above this. Like Jen can hear me while she's yeah. competing right here. Super, Which is very, very unique. unique. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. unique. Um, but, um, I mean, you guys have fought all over the place. Yeah. I mean, you were saying you've been to 20, 24 countries now? Uh, we're at, well, no, we did 20. 20, yeah. 20? <laughs> yeah, we did the count last night. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And where, I mean, where where have you fought? I mean, Trinidad and Tobago is, is that's I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that's it's right the off the coast of Africa. Right? No, no, no. It's it's just off the coast of Venezuela. It's oh, the okay. most southern... Uh, um, I'm thinking about Zimbabwe or somewhere. <laughs> or, or, yeah. or Madagascar or something. Yeah, but Madagascar. Yeah, 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 yeah Madagascar. East Coast. Um, now, Trinidad and Tobago is just below the the, uh, the hurricane belt uh, in the Caribbean. It's the most southern Caribbean island. 
just off the coast, like in, on on the tallest peak in uh, Port of Spain, Trinidad and Tobago, Trinidad, uh, you can see the Venezuelan coast, which is like, I don't want to ever go over there, at least not at this time. <laughs> no, now is not the time. Um, um, so that, that's actually the only country other than the United States that I fought in. Okay. Uh, but then I've, I've coached in um, Korea, um, Japan, Australia, uh, and then of course all throughout the United States, MSG, tons of times in Vegas and California and Colorado and yeah, just I've been a lot, lot of places, man. I've, yeah, yeah. It's one of the cool things about the sport. Once you progress to the level you progress to, is, yeah. is these. It's like being a comedian or being someone who gets to travel a little bit for their work and get to go experience this culture. Exactly. And yeah. uh, I mean, who who did you get to uh, corner at MSG? Um, a girl named Alice Yager. She fought at the on the Bellator card up there that was headlined by Matt Metrione and Fedor Emelianenko. Nice. She. Um, um, Alice Yager, known as a soccer mom, a bit of an older fighter, um, and she got an opportunity to fight Heather Hardy up there, and we we dropped a, we dropped the fight, but she was prepared well, she fought well, and uh, and she got that tag of being able to fight at MSG, and then um, she was she was on the the early part of the card, so then we got to watch um, James Gallagher beat Loyoto Machida's brother, and I yeah. had just uh, a year before that James Gallagher and I had had trained and, and eaten together in in Iceland at. Uh, with Mjolder in, in Reykjavik, Iceland, and um, and so seeing him and hanging out with him and it, MSG was was incredible. I'd never been to New York City before, and so we stayed in Manhattan at the New Yorker and, and got to got to have that whole experience. And then at the end of the night, all the fights are done. We're back at the hotel. Fedor had had been uh, KO'd by Matt Mitrione, right. but me growing up like buying books of of um, technique, I had two books. I had uh, Fedor Emelianenko and I had uh, BJ Penn, and um, and my ground striking even to this day when I teach my fighters, a lot of it's emulated off of the way that Fedor would fight, especially in his pride days. Just just an animal, a beast. So I never was the guy that if I saw a fighter, um, even in the in the in the in the youth part of my days, going, can I get a picture? Can I get an autograph? I was never that guy. Yeah, I just, yeah. I just it, it didn't appeal to me. Excuse me, but um. When, when I saw Fedor at the hotel, at the New Yorker, after that night, and I'm, I'm in the lobby with, uh, with, with Stephen Wright, who had gone up there to coach with me, and um, Fedor starts to come down with his, his entourage, and I wasn't gonna ask him for a picture or anything, like that, especially he just got fucking knocked out, um, but I stood up, and he locked eyes with me, and I bowed to him, and he bowed back to me and passed right in front of me, and I was just like. <laughs> so it, was like it, was, it was one of those things like that, uh, that was like the cherry on top of being an MSG, even though my fighter dropped the fight, even though one of my favorite fighters dropped his fight. Like yeah. I got I got to have a little a little something for me. Yeah, and what, what is your, like, I mean, what is your favorite part about being a coach? I mean, if you, is, is this a, it's been an obsession for you, clearly, right? I mean, and. It's, it's turning these, these fighters, these, turning a regular person into a competent and skilled fighter and watching them go from, I don't know shit, to I can compete against anybody. Yeah. That for me, like that, that's it, it keeps me driven. It's a wild. That's a wild thing to see yourself and to know that you were you've given this person a skill set as a teacher. I've passed it down. It was yeah. passed to me, and now I'm passing it down, and now it's being executed. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so just as a as a coach overall, like, what would be your um, you know your main message? Like, if you. It, it's a Tim Ferriss thing. What, if you had a billboard, what would be the thing you put on that billboard for any fighter? I mean, if, if, if you're serious about fighting, you need to put in a, a couple hours a day, a few hours a day yeah. for 10 years, for a decade, yeah. so that you can be competent within, the, within fighting skill because it's not done overnight. It's not done in a week or a month or a year or two years or three years. It takes a lot of fucking time. You know with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu how much fucking time it takes to be competent in the ground. And once you're competent in one part, there's somebody else, like Curtis. Like, like yeah. rolling with Curtis is, is yeah. not fun at no. all when he wants to turn it up. No. Um, but he's a fucking, he's the man, he's a, he's a beast. Um, and he's put in the time and he's developed the skill set. But the first day that he stepped on the mat, I can guarantee you, he may have known some wrestling and been a tough yeah. guy, but you put him up against Curtis today and it's, it's a yeah. completely different animal, right? The same thing like it takes time it you you have to lose you have to learn to be able to lose on the mat um, and and have growth within those losses um, 
What was the loss that taught you the most? And what did you learn from it? The loss that taught me the most. Man, I haven't, I haven't thought about that actually. The loss that taught me the most. Whether it's on, on the mat or off the mat. Taught you most about yourself, maybe. Of like what you needed to change, what you needed to, what what gave you the biggest insight into the sport of mar mixed martial arts that you would could have well, never you, gained. You know, you know, one that, that just kind of it actually it kind of fucked with me in, 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 a, in a negative sense. Uh, that really it it kind of turned the tide of my fighting career. Um, is I got I got I got royally screwed up screwed in a title fight by a, an error in, on a referee's position against a, a current UFC fighter. Um, and we had fought for four rounds and it became Texas's professional fight of the year, 2011. And, um, and ultimately Texas controversial call of the year, 2011. And um, I, had, I had lost the first round. I was starting to lose the second round and came back. I had won the third round definitively, definitive, definitive, definitive. Definitively. All definitively. Gotcha. Gotcha. My goodness. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Winning the fourth round, and we get into a crazy scramble to where the guy's on his knees, and I'm stood over the top of him. And you can't oh, knee somebody yeah, in the yeah, face, yeah. but I grab his head and I need him directly in the chest and pull his head by my hip. Ref's vantage point, saw the head rear back, says it was an illegal blow. The guy rolls around the ground covering his face. You start seeing the replays all in there. The knees hitting him directly in the chest. The, uh, the, the His coaches at that time were saying, stay down, stay down, stay down. And he played it all for, for what it's worth. And there's some video of him being helped up. And he's like, he's acting like he's phased and, and dazed in his head. And and it just played the fucking part. And that, like that, that hurt a lot because that was like the next step to get me into the WEC uh, at yeah. that time. And, and I knew that I was kind of fed up. I had a couple of, of pretty shitty calls leading up to that point, um, and, but I was just like, yeah, I'll be all right, I'll be all right. But then, that was in April 2011, and, I, and then that very next month, I went and traveled for the very first time. I went to Scotland, my first country outside of the United States, Mexico as a, as a child too, but um, I fell in love with traveling, and then I, there was something over in, with, with, the, with dealing with that, that loss with traveling for the first time I was like you know what fuck this I'm gonna keep fighting but I'm probably not gonna make it into the UFC or the WEC but it's okay I'm gonna still continue to fight so I'm just gonna go and fight and fight and fight and make as much money as I can doesn't matter if I win doesn't matter if I lose I'm a tough motherfucker I'm gonna find out who whoever the toughest guys are on the on the roster on the scene and I'm gonna fight them and um and it was the wrong way to do it because then I ultimately went into a in a in a in a, in a pretty bad losing phase I would lose a lot and I'd win some and I'd lose a lot and ultimately I was just like I was too far underneath after a guy yeah. who started out so well with so much promise with like he's the next big thing in Texas to a guy that was like well he was really fucking tough but he just kind of lost his way there was that's the loss that really kind of set me there and then and then I hung up the gloves and I was like because you know Jen started getting into her into her world championship phase if you will that run um, and I always knew that I wanted to continue being associated with mixed martial arts. And, uh, and I knew the coaching aspect was there. And I was like, you know what I can do now is I went through all these trial and tribulations to myself. It was all uh, self-made. Um, yeah. So now- The spar, the hard sparring, it was all, it was all self -made. All of it, yeah, all because it was, it, the, the, the lessons were- Yep, had to learn, had to learn the, yeah. the, the lesson of hard knocks, school of yeah, hard knocks. Yeah. Um, so now as a coach, I can go forward and help these, these fighters not make the same decisions that I made. Um, I made them, you don't need to make them. Yeah. Yep. And that's why I'm now I'm in the, the, the place of power, if you will, the oversight as the, uh, the orchestrator and can show you a much better path, a much smarter path for longevity within this. How, uh, what, 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 do you, what do you look at as like your next fight? I mean, how many fighters do you have right now that, that are under you, that are fighting professionally, that are fighting amateur yeah i've got um we had i had a, actually had a bit of a split with the team um a couple of months ago and most of my fighters came with me uh some stayed at the old school and, and that's fine you know we, we all have to choose our own path within this this career um so i think i have 
18 now and I had something like 26 or 27. Um, so 18 now and one, uh, and I, I haven't even done the, done the count because I've had so many other things going on. Um, but uh, I've got some really, really good high level pros. And then I've got some amateurs, like the two that have, they came with me here for this week. Yeah, yeah. You know, one's been with me for six months, one's been with me for eight months. And they're still a couple of years away before I can put them into competition. But they're the ones that are like, I'm putting in the work, putting in the work, yeah. putting in the work. My talks to them have resonated. My training has resonated. And, uh, and, and I'm starting to see the, uh, the development of them. But um, yeah, I've got at least, I mean, close, close to two dozen fighters that are still with me, still grinding it out. And um, multiple ones signing up, like seeing us at the, at the UFC gym in North Ocean Hills and like wanting to be a part of it. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. I mean, I still, now and ultimately I'm, I'm, I'm looking to open up my own facility, the yeah. Ethos Training Center. Uh, Hopefully in Arlington. What, what's it going to be called? Ethos, Ethos Training Center. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Um, the Ethos Training Center. So now it's Ethos Training Center at the UFC gym, and then it's going to be the Ethos Training Center in Arlington. Well, we're, the, we're Team Ethos MMA team at Ethos the MMA. UFC gym, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and the school will be the Ethos Training Center. Okay, okay, yeah. cool, yeah. cool. Yeah. So yeah. we'll have we'll have uh, Ethos Muay Thai, Ethos MMA, Ethos Jiu Jitsu, cool. um, Ethos Yoga, maybe, Ethos yeah. Barbers, Ethos Tattoo Artists. <laughs> and, uh, I want I, I, I yeah. want to build a, a culture, and I want to build. I'm very inspired by Mjolnir MMA in, in Reykjavik. It's 32,000 square foot facility. It's the most badass fucking gym in the world. Um, and they have everything. They have a hand carved bar in there that oversees two of their training halls of their six training halls. The, the facility is built into the side of the mountain. So yeah. um, in, in one part of that, like, so when the, when it rains outside, the mountain on the inside cries and it's like, it's, Damn. It's it's insane. They have their barber shop. They have their masseuse. They have they have a lot. They have a, everything going on there. So you can just hang out there all day. Ultimately, that's what I'd like to bring to. Um, yeah. Being able to hang out at the gym all day makes it easier for you to have to have a spot with a bunch of fucking games. You want to you you want to have in betweens and go up to the arcade upstairs. Yeah, yeah go play yeah. for for an hour and go uh, chill have a cold plunge, have a hot tub, yeah. have have the re all the recovery aspect of it. You know, like like Exos is here for for recovery. Yeah. Across the street at the uh, the Onnit Gym, you have you have the infrared sauna and the and the, the cryotherapy. Same sense. Like ultimately, my goal is to have something like that in the DFW area. And that's like that's your big five year goal, kind of. Yep. Yeah, five, that, five year, that, ten year, like yeah. And that pushes everything into into the future too. For sure. What do you feel like? I heard you say yoga. I mean, what do you feel like um, outside of, off the mat? What do people need to do to be heavily prepared for combat itself? Hmm. I mean, are you a big strength and conditioning guy? Or are you a big yoga, cardio? Because some people will come in here and they'll only do jujitsu, and I'm like, I'm like, it's a long road. It is, it is. So, um, if if you had to choose between the two, and you had a you had one practice or the other, I will also say do the skill training. But if you are if you are driven to compete, you have to have complementary workouts. You have to use strength and conditioning yeah. workouts. You have to have recovery. You can't skip recovery. You have to make sure you're sleeping right. You're eating right. That you're doing all the things necessary to make sure your body is primed and ready for the next hard training session. If your time is limited for a day and you're like, I only have one practice, go do skill. Go go do the skill workout. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, hey man, it's been awesome talking to you. I think they're gonna start up a class going yeah. on here soon. So I, I we we don't have our we don't have our studio yet. I can talk all day. Yeah, you. I could talk all day too. So uh, <laughs> we don't have our studio yet. So one day we will have a wall here. It's gonna be awesome. Heck yeah. Um, but uh, but how how can everyone reach you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram, uh, Douglas Freight, F R E Y. Um, I'm also on Facebook. Uh, I don't do Twitter. I pissed off an entire country one time, uh, <laughs> and uh, and that that was uh, that was a unique experience of, of mine. So I shut down my Twitter account. Um, so yeah, Instagram, Facebook. <laughs> find me at Twitter's the UFC gym in the It is. It's. I mean, it is. It's one of those like it's it's unfiltered. Yeah. It yeah. Is. And it's it's, it's too a good easy. One. It's just a text message, essentially. Essentially, yeah. And you send some crazy yeah. text messages to your friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jen, Jen, when she won her first title, she she fought a, a Finnish girl, and uh, and that girl employed a, a couple of pretty dirty techniques, and I called her out on it. And when you when you have a, a fighter, an elite fighter from a small from a country that doesn't produce just a whole lot of elite fighters, there's a whole country that follows them. Yeah. And I called this girl out on Twitter, and I should not have. I should. I, I, I've tried to make amends since then. But I did, and uh, and whenever I opened up my Twitter the next time, I had thousands of mentions from Finnish people that 
I basically won't go to Finland. Uh, and, and and I think the Finland people are great. I, I have some friends from from that previous incident that are Finnish, and <laughs> nothing but respect to them and the Finnish people. But because of my mistake there, I was like, <laughs> I should unplug from Twitter. I, I don't need to have this. Bro, I should like, unplug from Twitter once <laughs> a week, dog. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, man, it's been a pleasure having you here all week. Yep. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, man. Hell awesome, yeah. brother. Thank you, brother. Yep, thanks, Travis. Appreciate it. 10th Planet Austin. <laughs>